everybody, and welcome to another session in the RISE Summit. And today we have here Gina Molikon Long, and she helps people get what they want faster and with less effort. She's an international best-selling author, compelling speaker, and peak performance coach with a mission to reveal greatness in individuals, teams, and organizations. Using her unique mechanistics approach called the ACME framework, she can show you exactly how to get out of your own way and reveal your greatness. Welcome, welcome, Gina. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, so I love what you do. It's almost feeling like, you know, on the other side of trauma, what is awaits for us. And once we go through that rabbit hole of healing, which I know you've got a lot to say about, um, you know, we can find our greatness and we all have it, no exception, me and you and everyone else, right? That's the, that, that is the premise. The birthright is we have everything we need, but in the same way that sometimes silver gets tarnished, you know, sometimes we have to clear away that tarnish. Mm -hmm. And that's the work, right? That's the healing work. That's the transformation. Truth. Like the, the, I really do believe this, you know, I mean, even the work that you do, the work that I do, the work that all the people that you're interviewing do, everything works. It all works. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter which path you choose, but but there are two preconditions that have to be in each individual before anything can work. And I, and you know, one is the desire, the real desire to change. And the other one is the willingness to do the work or the willingness to do what it takes. And these preconditions are not to be taken lightly because without them, no change is possible. Mm -hmm. I so agree with you. And I know from my experience, I'm sure you have a similar experience where say a couple, you know, the one person goes through such an amazing experience and transformation and they bring the, their partner and they say, oh, you must do it, you must do it. And it's never the same for them because they don't have that same willingness. They don't have that same commitment to, to, do, to, do, to do the work. And um, I always, you know, when somebody refers their somebody close to them to me, I say, it must come from them. They must call me. They must make the effort. Otherwise, I'm not taking them on. Well, and that's honestly like we do a lot of um, we 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 do a lot of training for people who are already coaches. So you know, people say, "What's this acne system?" And I go, "You know what? It's not another coaching program. Our system is based on the fundamentals of change. And so, if you work in the business of change, like any kind of coach, sport coach, business coach, health relationship, doesn't matter." then you need to understand how change works in humans, then your tools will work. So we're not another coaching program. We make, we make, we're sort of like spices. We make all coaching better. And, and I'm not very famous, right? So, you know, you don't see my name plastered all over quotes on everybody's, uh, on everybody's Instagram. But one of the things people quote me on is um, this quote that I say all the time, which is if someone doesn't want to change, there's literally nothing you can do to change them. But if someone wants to change, alternatively, there's nothing you can do to stop them. Mm -hmm. So the, the very basic fundamental of change is desire. And it has to be, mm -hmm. it has to be desire of the individual, but that that's not enough. That's just, that's just what starts the process. Then, then the willingness and the coachability and the willingness to give it what it takes, you know, um, people say they like change. I, I don't actually believe that. I think people like change that they want, but they don't like change. And I think the last two years are a perfect example of that. Um, you know, everybody's complaining, but you like change. Uh, but, you know, the, the, you know, you can ask anybody on the street, even, even probably a lot of people listening to this um, interviews, these interviews, because they try something and it didn't work and they go, oh, it didn't work. Right. Here's the thing. How many people out there have tried something wholeheartedly and fell flat on their face? Right. I mean, you, me, that's why we're doing this. Right. You don't write a book called The Secret of Successful Failing without being face down in the mud. So that can't be then because I gave it everything I had and I didn't get it. So what was missing? And the insight is that's not everything you had. See, that's everything you think you have. 
which is part of the problem because that's the current model of reality. And, and what I know from decades now of this work and study is that that's not everything you have. And in order to discover what you have, you have to give it what it takes, which means going beyond what you have, which means, you know, I always in my, in my big talks, when I do my big, you know, you know, in theaters and things, I show a video of a running race um, where a girl falls down in the middle of the race and she gets up and she runs and, you know, spoiler alert, she still wins, but it's ridiculous what she's done. And the thing is, you know, her coach might have said to her in the morning of the race, I really think you can win this by 50 meters or something like, and she would say, no, no, that's not my level. That's not who I am. You know, I'm not, that's not me. And even if the coach was a really positive thinker, and even if the coach was, a, 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 you know, really skilled in the coach's tools, it wouldn't make a difference. And in fact, even if the runner wanted to believe she could, but, but didn't have that mechanism inside, it wouldn't matter. And, and I always point out to people what taught her that she could win the race because she falls down and loses about, I can't tell exactly, we'll call it 30 to 50 meters on her competitors when she falls and she gets up and she runs and she still wins. And it's, a, and it's, it's the last lap of the race. So it's not like she has five kilometers to do the race. And, and what I tell my audience is always is the only thing that caused her to truly dig deeper was this adversity mm. called the fall. Mm. Now, no one wants to fall. It's not your choice on a Monday morning. You know, you skinned your knee, you ripped your socks, whatever. But the truth is that all the support systems she had, all the people she loved, blah, 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 all the practice, all the training, none of that was caused her enough and in my world, I call it perturbation, enough shock to cause her to dig deeper and find the resource, mm -hmm. right? And then she gave it what it took, which was running faster. But she didn't know she could run that fast until she fell and she had to. So often when people are recovering from traumatic events, you know, they're sort of locked in a survival pattern, which makes complete sense during the intense event. But one, two, five, 10, 20, 50 years later, the event is over. And, and now what we have are just habitual patterns. And so sometimes it requires a shock, right? And that, that shock cannot even, you know, um, work if the person doesn't have desire or willingness to give it what it takes. And, you know, we give up because we think, oh, that's all I had, but it's not. Sorry. <laughs> I love the story of the runner and it's such a beautiful analogy for life because really what happens when we bouncing back from that place of diving deep down because of an adversity or challenge or trauma, uh, we almost spring in ourselves to, you know, jump further, um, you know, upwards. And I mean, that is metaphorical, of course, it's not in terms of uh, distance, but you know, no. they, they go hand in hand. And what we gain from those failures, and I do that because I really don't believe in failures. I feel that life is happening for you. It's all about lessons that, you know, you need to learn. You need to cultivate the teachings of those lessons as you go along. And sometimes those pitfalls are there to give you exactly that so that you can equip yourself with, uh, you know, perhaps more compassion or depth of being or uh, kindness or forgiveness or whatever it may be that you can then cultivate that and that will open, I, I like to say, it will unlock your inner doors of greatness. Yeah, well, that's that's funny what we say. My, I mean, my why, the reason what gets me out of bed in the morning is to reveal the greatness. Mm -hmm. Now, that the presupposition there is it's all it's everywhere and my my you know I I go to to help reveal it but it's not my job to make you know I I don't think I'm the greatness police mm -hmm. um, but you know the the in the first book that I wrote and I'm a bit of a contrarian and you know I have a bit of a blunt edge to me because um, 
when you, you know, it's faster and with less effort. It's not for everybody. That's okay. But one of the things I really sought to do in that first book was to, 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 to sort of destigmatize the word failure. It's an, it's an effort, but we don't have to treat it like that. Here, here's the definition I like to offer. Now, I, my undergraduate degree was in engineering. So my work was all in feedback control. And, and in definition of failure is that the outcome didn't happen the way you would expect it. So failure means you didn't get what you wanted your way. That's it. And there's no shame in that, but it's a fact. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner you can just be with the word and then it can be applied to everything. And, and, you know, when I'm, when I'm working with, say with a private individual client, I might give them a task like, you know, um, I don't know, get some ridiculous coffee order, you know, something crazy, you know, half this and a little bit of that and a sprinkle of this. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to get it. And so I'll say, how did you do on the, the coffee order? And what I want them to be able to do is say, I failed to get what I wanted. And so I'm going to do it again. And so the reason I use this coffee order is because who cares? Right. And so it's a muscle. Once you can just get with the fact that the faster you can measure your process, whatever, whatever you're trying to get and be honest, you either get it and you celebrate and whatever, or you don't. So technically that's failure. It's end. And you feed back that into the system. The faster you can do that, that process itself, the more successful you will be because most people get stuck in the resistance of what's happening and they get stuck and they stay there and and it's ridiculous they you know they um they they placate it and they they soften oh i tried oh. okay you either got what you wanted or you got feedback if you got feedback put it back into the system period yeah i love how you simplify it and it's uh, it's true we need more practice in failures so we know how to bounce back from them and and really change our perspective to how we see them and i remember hearing um an interview with a very uh yeah a, a, bil- a woman billionaire i can't remember her name and she said that her father used to ask her every day what did you fail in today And mm-hmm. everyone thought it's, it's such a weird question, but he was mm-hmm. actually training her to see failures as part of life and as uh, stepping stones to her, in her journey uh, to success, right? Because yeah. um, this is the places where we learn the most. And so reframing the word failure is a, a great start, right? It really is just a measurement. I mean, if you were to measure something and it was supposed to be 10 centimeters and you measured it and it was nine, that's a failure. And it, it's not significant. And, and I think the person you were talking about is Sarah Blakely from yes, Spanx. That's um, right. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, so, and again, I'm not saying like this people misunderstand. And again, this isn't to go out for the purpose of failing. But it's to go out for the purpose of growth and recognizing in the purpose of growth, So, so I, I have this um, on, on my second book, page, page 165 of Thinkersync is a diagram called the process of change. And the process of change basically is the five stages that, that all change goes through, right? First one, comfort zone, no change. Second point is desire. And that's what starts change is this desire to change. When you're in your comfort zone, there's no change possible. That's, there's none possible because there's no need. And then the third stage is the change itself. It, it takes, that's how long it takes to change, okay? It's, a, it's an instant. Um, and most coaches think that that's what they're driving for. But, but what, we, what we show coaches is if you don't meet the preconditions, this doesn't happen. And then once this happens, if you don't integrate the change, so the fourth stage is, is, is the mastery of that new behavior so that it's, it's like regular, which becomes then the new comfort zone. And what we call that is the acme. Now, acme is an ancient Greek word for highest point. Um, it also, we turned it into an acronym because, you know, we're a business. Um, advanced ch- uh, change mechanisms of excellence. But really where it came from was my love of Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner and the Coyote. Um, and so when people hear the word, you know, acme, whatever, they think of the Coyote and they laugh. And this is good when you are trying to change laughter is good. But, you know, When you're going through the chain, when the, the stages of change, you're, and this is, this is so stupid and so simple, yet it's so profound. 
So I was teaching a class a couple of weeks ago and I was drawing this on the flip chart. And so I said, you know, you're in the comfort zone, no change is possible. The minute you move into the process of change, you are outside of your comfort zone. But I just, it, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this to people. The minute you do that, you will be uncomfortable. By definition, the comfort zone has a boundary. The minute you step your baby pinky toe outside of your comfort zone, I guarantee you it will be uncomfortable. So just accept that and move forward, right? So people get into the process of change and then they complain about how uncomfortable they are, how horrible it is or how difficult it is. But but it can't not be that way. It's either be stuck and comfortable or moving and somewhat uncomfortable. And the goal is to develop the resources to cope with the discomfort such that it's no longer uncomfortable. Mm. And then that's the new comfort zone, which we call ACME, which is the new highest point. And the reason we chose this word is because as if you've done any hiking ever, you get to the highest point. And the minute you're on the highest point, you realize there's another one in the distance, right? And so it doesn't end. Mm. And if you take these little distinctions and carry them with you as life is changing and as you're being challenged and as you fall down and skin your knee and, you know, we fail at something, then it, it, it helps keep you going because it's the expectation that it should be easy, but, but life is simple, but it's, it's not easy. Right. But the simplicity, it's, it's so simple. I mean, I, I can't tell you, you know, when I did my engineering degree, that was complicated. This is simple. And there are very few things you need to do. And honestly, and I'm not saying I am not the like positive, you know, just, just think positively and everything will be okay. The only two things you need to change anything in your life is a burning desire and a willingness to give it what it takes. That's it. Everything else will fall into place. You know, they'll meet you or me or one of the other dozens of speakers that you're having on here with their incredible processes. And, and it, you know, it will align because the desire and willingness are there and the, and the, and the individual who showed up, the person with the tools will line up, you know, from a, a, a style, a preference, a flavor, but, but honestly, it, 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 it doesn't matter. And this is the thing that people don't understand because there's so much I'm for this, anti that, for this, anti that, this works, this doesn't, you know, oh, I get so tired of it. It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, you know, I do this course in in the history of hypnosis and, um, you know, thousands of years ago, we just called it magic, right? But, But now I could do a process that would qualify as a magical process. I could say to you, I could speak a desire. I want to read um, your new book. Okay. So what's it? What's the title? Transforming Trauma. Transforming Trauma. So I could say, I want to read Transforming Trauma. So that's a statement of desire. And then I could perform a spell. Okay. And the spell would require me to pick up my magical device, move, move it around in a specific sequence. Okay. And then put my device down and then poof. In a period of time, as if from nowhere, a complete stranger would bring that book to me and it would show up out of nowhere. Now, 2000 years ago, we would call it magic. In fact, my grandmother lived to be 97. If she had ever witnessed me doing that, she would have been praying for my soul. Okay. But I just described online book ordering. It's not magic. And so magic becomes this word that we use when we don't understand technology. Okay, so so there are lots of people like me, like you, like all the people you're interviewing with technologies. They're not, they look like magic. They do because they they work like that. But what makes them work is the cooperation between the client and the individual person, right? Because they have desire to change and willingness to give it what it takes. So that is. And I, and I have the tools for that change and we meet up in a, in a local space and time and we have, you know, rapport and whatnot, but it could be anything. So 
pick your, pick your tool of preference. And this is why some medications work and some don't. This is why some surgery works and some don't. This is why some alternative treatments work and some don't. It's placebo, not placebo, you know, straight up hocus pocus because the desire and the willingness conditions were met. And then the person was completely coachable by the coach who had a tool that actually delivered the outcome that prom- promised. That's it. That, that, and I know I'm really simplifying a lot of life, but that's truly it. Now, the goal is to find what works for you. I really, really agree with you with everything you said. And it's really about, you know, when you say burning desire and willingness to do what it takes, I think that it comes down to having the choice, right? So we have the choice. And once we decide that this is what we want and we are the co-creators of life. So if we decide, then the universe comes towards us to <coughs> send us the right people to align us with the right frequencies. And some maybe, you know, on our journey um, will be what we describe as failures. You know, they might be what, you know, would not turn to be the way we want because it is a part of our journey and it is actually serving us on a higher level. So there is no right or wrong in that sense. But, you know, um, once we decide to walk that journey, then life presents itself exactly as it should. Well, and it presents itself. I mean, we have three basic mechanisms in our model and you, you touched on something that, is really important. So, you know, my, my latest talk that I do for uh, CEOs is called the science of intuition. And what I'm trying to show them is the, is the, and the resonant physics involved in our lives. Right. So, so, you know, the cell phone is a perfect example of resonant physics, the cell phone, you type a message, it encodes the message. It sends it out on the frequencies of your cell phone right? It gets picked up by the tower. It ends up in the receiver's phone. It gets decoded and it shows up on the screen with the fancy emojis. Okay. That that's basically that works because both phones are on the same frequency and they have the same hardware. Right. So we are also electromagnetic beings. I mean, I'm not going to get into it, but we are heartbeats and our brain waves and that's electromagnetic frequencies. And there's information being passed between us and other people, but also between us and the, and the field, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so what shows up in your life just matches that. I mean, I've basically just summarized a two hour talk now without getting into the science, but the point is that if you get what you want, then you know that how you tuned yourself was correct. Now this sounds difficult, except, you know, Maybe, are you old enough to, you know, use a radio, like a proper radio with a, you know, okay. So, because this, this example is getting to become, I have to bring a radio with me now when I talk, but you know, when you tune a radio, right. Uh, you know, I don't know, what kind of music would you like to listen to? What's your, what's your favorite kind of music? Oh, goodness. You're talking about radio days. That would be yeah, radio episode. days. Yeah. <laughs> radio days. If you were just like, tuning the radio, what would you, what would you look for? What kind Michael of Michael Jackson, probably. Michael Jackson, perfect. <laughs> so we'll call it we'll call it pop pop rock, right? Okay. Now you tune the dial, okay? Now imagine you accidentally tune the dial and you got um, heavy metal. Okay, so you failed to tune the dial correctly. Now are you going to collapse into a heap because you failed? No. Are you going to blame? your past. No, you're going to go, Oh, I failed. That's not, how do I know? Because the feedback I'm getting is incorrect. This isn't the right music. This isn't what I'm looking for. I need to keep tuning. And so you're going to tune again and then you hit the next station and maybe that's classical music. And you're like, no, that's not what I wanted either. Right. And so then you tune and you finally hit and it's, you know, and it's, it's beat it or something. And the feedback, it's yay. And all, you know, all you were doing was tuning and tuning and tuning. Now, when I use that analogy, everybody gets it. No one's going to, life's not over when you fail to tune the radio correctly. You, you know what to do when, when you don't have the music you're looking for. You, you just do it again and again and again until you find it. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I rent a car, sometimes I'm scanning through the radio for like 20 minutes trying to find a station because I don't know the stations in that place. But I don't, I notice that I don't get all upset about it. And so 
it's the same if you take the analogy, and this is what I do, this is what we do at Greatness U. We take things like the radio analogy, and then we apply them to real life. But it's the same approach. So we're process people. We're mechanistic. And that doesn't mean human beings are just machines. Please, you need to understand something here. Human beings are so complicated. That's part of the problem. Because we're so complicated, it it almost feels too overwhelming. So when we take a a mechanistic approach, it's just to help us isolate some variables to make it simpler. But if we use the radio analogy and it's basically, you know, did you get what you wanted by looking at the feedback? No. Okay, go back and do the process again. Retune the radio. Okay, measure it again. Okay, did you see why the word fail? Yep, nope, that was a fail. Okay, do it again. Okay, do it again. Do it again. Can you imagine if the first time you tuned the radio, you cried and resisted, or even worse, tried to justify to me that, oh, I, I actually want to listen to heavy metal. It's okay. It's it's good enough. I'll, I'll just stay here. It's you know, the shame of having to retune the radio would be horrible. I'll just stay here. Right? Like, what are you waiting? Like, are you crazy? So we would never do that with the radio. Why do we do that in our lives? And I think it also comes down to, do we know what we want? Right? Because this is the clarity to begin with. Because sometimes we Fire. don't even know what we want. We don't know ourselves enough. We don't have any plans um, you know, or, or no. a direction, a solid direction. So we don't actually know what we want. Most of us will be, it will be easier for them to say what they don't want than to actually articulate what they do want. Well, and, but see, this is the thing is fine. Then articulate what you don't want and then just write the opposite. I mean, it's, again, it, it's not super complicated, but it, it, I don't know if people don't know what they want. I think they hesitate to express it because they don't know how to get it. And they, for some reason, think they need to know how, but I, as I always tell all of my students, if you knew how to get what you want, you'd already have it. We wouldn't be having this conversation. So I know we want life to be in a straight line. I I'm the same as anybody else. I want it to be simple and efficient and straight line, but clearly it's not, if it, if it were the straight line, you'd have the thing you wanted by the means of, you know, your problem solving. If that's not the case, which is generally my experience with most of my students, then it must not be, there must be a way you don't know about. Now, you talked about the universe. I, I, I like to make it far less of a commitment. It, it's basically just the, like a mirror. So, and again, back to the basis in, in physics here, the world will reflect your tune, your frequency, your state. And so you, you, what you put out is kind of what will come back, but, but not because of anything magical or fanciful, just because that's the way it works. But, but it's not a straight line. And the unconscious part of our mind already is hooked up to that field, if you will, or hooked up to that universe. Mm -hmm. or hooked up to God, call it whatever you want, but it's hooked up. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to bring into your awareness that path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. But it's not always a straight line. And so sometimes, you know, you you have this, I'm going to work harder, I'm I'm going to do more, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And meanwhile, the pull is to, you know, go, I don't know, golfing. And, and, but I can't, well, I have to work. But what you don't realize is that in that action is the path of least resistance. Maybe the person there is the fast track to whatever you're trying to do. Again, I'm just making this up, but um, the path of least resistance is usually not straight and linear. But if you have, and if you have a clear desire to your point, not a, not a, you don't need to know how, but you have to be hooked up emotionally. You have to be emotionally connected to the object of your desire. If that's the case, then I can teach you a very basic um, process to, you know, kind of leverage everything we've talked about to connect with your object of desire, like a radio station, like that is literally very simple, not, not complicated, but requires practice, right? So you've seen the karate kid, right? Wax on, wax off. So once you, once you have a successful change, then you have to master it. And that's why people 
where people sort of break down. They think, oh, I did it once. I can't replicate it or I, or worse, I've never done it. But even what, if you've done it once, you have to do it so you can't not do it that way because in a crisis, i.e. the last couple of years, you, you will go back to your most comfortable zone. You, you'll go backwards. And that's what we're experiencing is a lot of re, re-opportunities, if you will, for um, people to get back on their path. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do we have time to do the process? Yes, please. I would love to experience it. And I'm sure our audience as well. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we do here? Let's, let's do it together. This is again, now I could do a two and a half hour talk on the science behind this. So I suppose if you really need to know that maybe just contact me, but if not, you're just going to have to trust me that our bodies are senders and receivers of electromagnetic frequency. That's the first thing you need to get. The second thing you need to get is that we live in a field of electromagnetic frequency. You know, the earth has a, a magnetic field. It also has an electric field. So we, we, we live in these fields. So we, we are like cell phones, you know, at a different frequency than our cell phones. So if that's the case, then everything is connected by this field. And this is very, very basic resonant physics and a tiny little bit of quantum physics. And it, you know, all the parts of the talk are just like, ooh, ah, but the practice is very easy to do. Now, before we do the practice, one thing I have to distinguish, the signal you get based on intuition and desire is the same as the single you get based on fear. And there's no way to tell. So it's sort of like when you tune the radio dial, you will hear music. Like, doesn't matter where you tune the dial. It's all music. Now, if the Michael Jackson is what you want and the heavy metal is what you don't want and what you're afraid of, then you have to be able to tell the difference. So the way that we tell the difference is based on what you're focused on. So it sounds very trivial, right? Focus on what you want. This is part of our, our, our second, me- third mechanism, the performance triad. You have to focus on what you want. Now, it's well, why wouldn't you? Okay, well, we have all these fancy words that trick us into thinking we're focused on what we want, but our emotional guidance system will never lie to us. So here's the gut check. If you can say what you want and you can sort of articulate it, maybe even as a smart goal or whatever, and the emotional uh, response of your body is what we would classify as positive, joy, gratitude, whatever, whatever, um, then you are actually focused on what you want. Now, if you say these fancy words in your goal, but you are stuck in what we would call an an emotional state, we would call negative. Okay. It's just a guidance system from your unconscious mind to say, you are actually not focused on what you want. Don't believe the bullshit coming out of your mouth. Actually, the programs that you're, you know, the strategies that you're enacting right now, they have you focused away from what you don't want. And because of that, you're tuning to the wrong station. Okay, so it's the um, it's the negative emotion that is the guidance system. So before we do this process, just a quick acronym for those of you who are like, oh, shit, now what do I do? Okay, so I just say, you know, people used to say this to me all the time because my background is Italian and I can, you know, I have a lot of passionate breadth in my emotional uh, in my emotional repertoire. And people used to say to me, oh, just snap out of it. And I, you know, I used to be very resistant of that. And then I thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to pull that into my practice. So I made an acronym, I like acronyms for SNAP. So when you find yourself clear with your goal, but feeling negative emotion, stop what you are doing, mm-hmm. notice the negative emotion and do any tool on earth to alter it and then proceed, stop, notice, alter, proceed. Mm-hmm. So basically what you're doing here is you're putting, you're, you're doing the work to keep your focus on what you want. Probably all the people you're interviewing have some kind of technique. Of course, I do too, for altering that state. Mm-hmm. Fine. Let's assume you do all that. Okay? So we fast forwarded now. We've done three and a half weeks of work. Here we go. So the process um, for accessing and, and building the muscle of your intuitive signal or getting a stronger radio signal, if you will, is first, you must know what you want and you must know that you are focused on what you want. Check. Okay. Okay. The next thing is you will have a question about it. Like, what should I do next? Or 
Who should I call? You must write this down because we need a context, right? For the signal, we need to know what station we're tuning to. So you have to write down the question, okay? Then we need to, um, you know, turn on your radio, so to speak. So here's how you do that. You, you need to establish your technology into the state it will be for receivership. So it's kind of like turning on the radio. So you're going to slow your breathing down slower and faster or slower and deeper than normal, right? So perfect breath rate is six breaths per minute, but that's not as important as just slower and deeper. And you're going to activate a feeling of gratitude, which is going to require you to relive an, a, a memory or something so that you can re-feel the feeling. And you're going to do those two things. Well, ideally, we would do them for 15 minutes, but we'll just do a little practice run here. Okay. Um, so ideally, you do that for at least 15 minutes to really establish a coherent state. And these are, these are real scientific terms. Okay. So a coherent state means you're, now your electromagnetics of your body are receptive. And then after the 15 minutes, you're going to focus back on your question. And then you're going to download, right, via writing, download all the impulses, uh, thoughts, ideas. Not, you're not going to force it. It's sort of like brainstorming. You just write, 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 any insight, anything. And in a stream of consciousness until it's done, right, and then the process is over. And then you have to go do those things or organize them. You know, maybe it's, you know, five things are the same task or organize what you got and then go do it. And here's the thing. You have to measure the outcomes in your real life. And if you fail, you have to go and do it again. And if you get the thing you want, then that was the right radio station. Like it's that simple. So let's, let's, that's, that's sort of the explanation. Let's just give it a, a little try. Okay. Right. Now you, yeah, if we can probably, probably, yeah, to like five minutes, that would be great. Absolutely. Five minutes. So mm -hmm. What's something that you want? Let's just do a very basic thing. What's something that you want? Something that I want. Um, sure. Uh, I want to... Um, Maybe something about the book. Yeah. <laughs> I want the book to be a bestseller. Thank you. Yeah, you want the book to be a bestseller. <laughs> Great. Perfect. I mean, look at... And by the way, those of you who are watching... When somebody lights up like a Christmas tree like that, they're focused <laughs> on what they want. I don't need to make sure you're in a positive emotional state. I can use my sensory acuity. Okay, so let's just do, we'll do, we'll do about 90 seconds of breathing. Now, this is I, one of the things I'm trained in lots of things, but one of the things I'm trained in is very high level is, is um, through the Institute of Heart Math. So we're using their um, basic technology to tune your system. Okay, so mm -hmm. just make sure your feet are flat on the floor. And, and those of you who are watching, do this with us. So just blow out so that we can breathe together. Okay. And we'll do this about 90 seconds. So breathe in. And just breathe out. Nice. That's good. Nice and deep. Good. Now on the next breath in, I want you to imagine if you're drawing that breath in through your heart. Just imagine. Put your focus on your heart and just imagine and then breathe out. Now this time, as you imagine breathing in through your heart, I want you to just recall a memory where you know you felt grateful. Just recall the memory right now. You don't need to do anything with it. And then breathe out. Good. On the next breath, when you breathe in to this memory, I want you to drop inside your body at the time. So looking through your own eyes, see what you saw, hear what you heard, and feel the feeling of gratitude. Good. Now, once you're inside the memory, start to see if you can build this feeling of gratitude as you breathe in through your heart. And maybe just observe the feeling, just, you know, maybe observe it. Where is it in your body? And then do it again. And again, by giving it your attention, you're making it stronger. So, you know, does it have a shape, color? Just notice the qualities of the emotion as you build it. Let's do it one more time. Really build this emotion. Now with your will, build the emotion of gratitude or appreciation. Now on this final breath, 
Oh, actually, we'll do two more. So breathe in, really activate the feeling of appreciation or gratitude. And when you breathe out, imagine almost sending out to the object of your desire, sending out to the people who will make this book a bestseller. And then breathe in again. And do the same thing, extend it even further, send it out, out into the universe, out into the field to connect with the things that are going to make this a bestseller. Okay, now, because we've only done it for about 90 seconds, just tell me what's top of mind in helping you to make this a bestseller. What has dropped into your mind, even in this initial state? Connection. To? To okay. people. Connection Great. to, yeah. Great. So then, you know, you would build on that and maybe your actions would be, am I, is this connecting, whatever. So that's the process, basically. Now you need to go out and you need to take action in the realm of connection. Relentless, lots of action, absurd action, crazy action. I mean, when my books came out, I remember I would go into bookstores and I would get them off the shelf. I would sign them and then I would bring them to the front and tell the bookstore I signed them and then they would put a sticker on them and they would put them at the front of the store, right? You have to be ridiculous in your pursuit. You have to email people and that, you know, you have no business emailing, but they're just people, right? So you, you, you have to sort of do that. You have to take relentless action. Now, that's the condensed version of the practice. The, re the real version would take that 90 seconds that we did and draw that out into 15 minutes with the purpose of creating this, this connection. And I'm not speaking metaphorically, right? Strengthening, you know, it's like fine tuning a radio until it's no static mm -hmm. and then taking action. So that's the practice and anybody can do it. And it will, it will, you know, every day it will strengthen your connection to the object of your desire until it turns up in your physical reality it's beautiful and it's powerful and you deliver it in such an eloquent way so simplifying it and yeah i utterly enjoyed this conversation thank you so much and You're welcome yeah i need to wrap it up i really do enjoy it but i really do want to wrap it up uh, and i know you've got a, a gift to the audience so maybe speak a little bit about that and yeah sure. Uh, you know, I, I, when I do these things all the time and, and I like to take a product that we sell and just give it to your audience because they've already invested and this is sort of the, the benefit for them. So we have a program that we normally charge 88.88 for, but it's free for your members, but only if they go to the link for you guys. So that that's specific for you guys. Um, and what it is, is it's a seven day program. We call it Greatness Week or the Greatness Challenge. And it's seven practices, not the one I just taught you, seven other um, practices designed to get you kickstarted into something you want. So it's seven days to kind of turn the ship, if you will. And people, we often promote this product at New Year's, you know, for New Year's resolutions and things like that. And so basically it's, it's uh, a seven day, it's, you know, seven's enough. You can kind of commit seven days. But at the end of seven days, you will have learned um, some very concrete techniques like this one, um, mindsets, techniques that enable you to get where you're going faster and with less effort. They're not the end, just to be clear. They're the beginning. But they, they put a lot of our work at Greatness You into a very easy, you know, beautifully shot, lovely uh, Greatness Week that everybody can, and you can give it to anybody who's listening. And uh, do you want me to tell them where to get it? Or do you... No, we will have the links on this. Okay, page. great. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure having you. And thank you for the amazing work that you do. And I can feel your, your passion. It's super contagious. And um, yeah, bless you. Th thanks for including me. And, you know, honestly, just everybody who's listening to this, you already have what you need. Um, and part of the game of life is to just play around with it to see what you find. Yeah. So on that positive note, thank, thank you. you very much for being here uh, right until the end. And I'm your host, Nuna Isima, and I'm sending you so much love and blessings for your journey until the next time we meet. Bye-bye.